Christianity, <clears throat> is that a crutch for weak-minded people, for those who believe in God, who are people essentially like people who believe in fairy tales, unwilling to face the hard evidence of science? Is that true? Is it that Christians need something outside themselves to give meaning to their lives? I think that's a critique that all of us are kind of familiar with. It's uh, what we hear from different atheists and uh, maybe implicit in, if not explicit, in movies and music and popular culture. It's a serious charge. And for us as Christians, I think we feel, at least I feel, it kind of cuts close to home because there are so many things in our faith and in uh, the scriptures that seem to point to weakness. And Jesus' words that we're going to be looking at today, blessed are the poor in spirit, kind of makes me think, well, what does he mean? And are we people who are weak and poverty-stricken? And are we just gullible and incompetent people? Is that what Jesus is commanding us to? The Sermon on the Mount that we're going to be looking at today, and by the way, today is an introduction to this really important message, and we're just going to be looking at the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes, as Tim said. And so I'm going to take a fair bit of the time today, sort of in introductory uh, comments towards uh, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and then there will be some time, uh, you know, where we'll focus on our text on the, who, what Jesus is speaking about being poor in spirit and uh, dive into that a little bit. But, uh, you know, if you'll forgive me if I wander around a little bit beginning with introductory and contextual remarks. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is laying out kind of his magnum opus. This is his, this is his message that is defining for his believers what it means to follow him. And so it's maybe, uh, you know, the, the most famous of all of Jesus' teaching. In these words of the Beatitudes, some of the most memorable or looked at uh, teachings of Jesus. And he answers fundamental questions here. Questions about uh, what is real? What is the good life? What is the blessed life? Who is the blessed person? How can I live a blessed life. These are fundamental questions that people throughout history have asked, whether it's Greeks or Romans or, or Canadians today. We, we ask these questions. What is the good life? What does it mean to live a right life? Can I even live that life? Who is the right and good person that I should follow? And so in Jesus' life, people, or Jesus' time, people also were asking those questions and, and there were answers around that people could absorb. The Greeks had answers to these questions. You know, we still look at uh, Greek philosophy as a, a high point. People still, Aristotle and Plato, and they, they consider how did the Greeks wrestle with these fundamental questions? They were great thinkers. Jews also were working out reality, and they had the Old Testament. For them, reality was God's law and God's way. But it wasn't just that, because they had experienced a real crisis. The period leading up to Jesus' time, the, the uh, land of Israel was like in disarray. And many different governments and rulers had come and gone, and they had gone through times of rebellion. There was a famous rebellion led by uh, the, uh, called the Maccabean Re Rebellion, and a guy named Judas Maccabeus led uh, forces against the, the, the Greek king of the time, Antiochus Epiphanes, who had desecrated the temple, and this was just the Jews were fed up, and they led a violent uprising, and many Jews remembered this. And in fact, in Jesus' day, if you recall, some of the disciples that Jesus called to follow him were called zealots. They were, they were those people who were in favor of violent uprising. Others of Jesus' day were Pharisees. Uh, that was a, a big group that he impact, or, or interacted with. These were people who were very committed to upholding all of the Jewish laws and in being righteous people, religious people. And Jesus had a lot to say to them. That was a big reality. People, all of Jesus' listeners knew about the Pharisees. They thought maybe Jesus was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law, but he was different than them. There was the Sadducees, another group there, and they were, they were very conservative, also concerned with the law, but they were more like just making accommodation, like trying to keep the peace. Just conservative folks who said, let's not rock the boat 
and they were more inclined to sort of um, make a deal with the Roman Empire and say, let's just, you know, get along to get along and, and it'll all be well. They didn't really believe in heaven or eternity. And so in the middle of all these ideas about what is goodness and truth, Jesus comes along and he gives this Sermon on the Mount. And in recording uh, this message, Matthew, the author of our gospel that we're looking at today, by the way, will be in Matthew chapter 5, uh, if, if you have a Bible and want to turn there, but uh, if not, maybe over the next summer time, it would be good for you to, uh, to go home and read these uh, chapters, that Matthew 5 through 7, that contain the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. So Matthew is preparing for us... Um, an understanding of Jesus' magnum opus, and he really sets the stage, and he's pointing that Jesus is the one. And so we're going to look at today that Jesus is the one who defines reality, and also that the message of the good life is different than, than we would have understood it to be. And then finally, we'll look at what it means to be poor in spirit. In Matthew 5, 1 and 3, then it says, Now when he saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus sets out the good life, the life that God favors, the life that is blessed. Uh, here at North Langley, that life we've called over the last number of years the apprentice life. The life of following Jesus, the good life. And we begin with this first point, that the blessed life is defined by Jesus. The good life is defined by Jesus. When Matthew records that he went up to the hillside and sat down and began to teach them, it's a clear indication that he's taking the posture of a, of a teacher. So uh, that he had the crowd and he sat down to teach them. This is what a teacher would do. And so... Uh, Matthew is setting this up for us, that Jesus is the one that everyone is listening to. Now, Janet and I had the privilege of being in Israel last year. Yeah, it was last year, in Fe a year ago in February. Yeah, maybe it's two years ago now. Oh, time flies. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, there's debates about which hillside it was, but basically it's just got overlooking the, hill hill the, the uh, Sea of Galilee on a hillside. So lots of settings that it could be in, but Jesus had crowds following, and they were watching. And they were fascinated to hear what he would teach. Matthew has introduced us to Jesus in the previous verses uh, and chapters. He told us that Jesus, he gave us the genealogy of Jesus, that Jesus came from the line of David, that he was born of a virgin. He tells us about Jesus' birth, that he was worshipped by the Magi, that he was, an assassination attempt came against him by Herod. And then Jesus was tested in the desert after being announced by John the Baptist who was preparing the way, he went into the desert and there he kind of had a confrontation with Satan himself. And Jesus came out victorious, full of the Holy Spirit and preached this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at, ha is at hand. And it was like the continuation of what John the Baptist was preaching. Then Jesus calls disciples to, his, to himself and he goes out through the region of the Galilee preaching this message and healing the sick. And many miracles happen, and so the crowds are coming. And then this message comes. And I'm going to give you a quick outline of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you, you can read it yourself and sort of track with, with Jesus' message. And it's good to kind of look at it in the blocks that he's teaching. But the message goes something like this. The introduction to the message, what we're looking at in this series on the Beatitudes, is the shocking upside-down or downside-up values of the kingdom. So he outlines those in the Beatitudes. Then he talks to his followers, the disciples, and the crowds who might have been listening as well further beyond about the incredible value of their lives, the meaning of the, and significance of life. You are a city on a hill. You are the salt of the earth, he says to them. And then Jesus goes back and talks about his own cont uh, continuity with all of that the prophets gave and all that the Old Testament taught. Don't think that I came to set aside the law. I'm the fulfillment of the law. And then he jumps into the bulk of his sermon, which is an illustration of kingdom life. And he talks to the disciples and to all of us who are reading how we should treat others, how we should handle conflict, how we respect the other, how we keep our promises, how our words matter, how we respond to injustice, 
how we live authentically, how we practice our devotion, where we should put our treasure and our trust, and how we evaluate ourselves and others. And finally, Jesus wraps up his sermon in chapter 7, verse 7 and following, with how to stay close. How do I, how do I walk this walk? And he talks about how do, I stay, how do we stay close to Jesus and finish well? How do we build our house on a rock, not on sand? Now, when we look at this sermon and everything that Jesus was teaching, we can see that these are not laws. The Sermon on the Mount is not a bunch of rules. It goes way beyond rules. Jesus actually contrasts his teaching with the rules, with the Ten Commandments. You've heard said that you shouldn't kill or murder. But I tell you, if you, you, know, if you hate another person, if you call them a fool, you've killed them. You've done it. The Bible says you shouldn't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look on a person with lust, you've committed adultery. So all of a sudden, it's much deeper. It's attitudes. It's not rules. It's attitudes. He's describing a changed life. Radical. So people were listening, going, oh, this is shocking. This description of this blessed life captured his listeners and in many ways delighted them, but it was not what they had assumed. And so Jesus is defining the good life, but we find out that it's, it's, it's shocking. It's, it's, it's opposite to what we thought in many ways. And, and a lot of Jesus' teaching is like this. On, on the one hand, when Jesus says things, you, right away you know, oh, I, I know what he's talking about. You know, when you, when you read just it's amazing. I get it. I know. And then you read further and you think, yeah, but, but what, else, what else does he mean? There's deeper meanings in it. There's always a, a mystery in what Jesus teaches. And so we see that in this account as well. So the people were listening to his amazing teaching and finding they were, they were thrilled, but also uh, wondering what it all meant for them. And by background and context, if we picture ourselves with the with the crowds there uh, in Jesus' time. We talked a little bit about you know, the Romans and the Greeks and all the different uh, traditions that they would have had, but these people in particular who were there on the hillside, they were Galilean people. So these disciples were chosen from fishermen and local people. There was a tax collector in their midst too, Matthew, but they were, they were Galileans, regular people. Um, they weren't poverty-stricken. Uh, Galilee was prosperous. There was good fishing in the lake, and the land was very fertile. They could farm. But still, they were people of the land. They were blue-collar people. people. These weren't sophisticated sort of... Univer- there wasn't a university town there, and they certainly weren't the elites of Jerusalem. Uh, so when they heard Jesus' description, uh, they were captured by, by what Jesus described as the good life. When they heard him say, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, they, they, I, I think they received it as a message of hope. Uh, when they heard, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, they, they received that as good news because they, they felt close to mourning and hurting. And, and I think about ourselves and I think, um, how do we receive these words and teachings of Jesus? And I think this is uh, where I... Where I struggle a little bit because I think about my context and our context here. We're Canadians. We live in a great country. There's peace and prosperity. Um, and uh, we've got everything we need. You know, all our needs are met. We, we, you know, we may be the wealthiest kind of people that ever lived on this planet, you know, with, with the provision and, and blessings that we have. So when we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit, Maybe some of us feel like, I, I don't really feel poor in spirit. I feel like, you know, I, I feel pretty set. You know, we feel, we feel secure. But then I, I, I thought, but, but really, many of us, and maybe here today, you go, I, oh no, actually, I know exactly what, what that means. I, I feel poor in spirit. I feel, I feel lost. I, I feel at the end of my rope. And uh, so at any point in time, maybe we're processing Jesus' words diff- differently But let's realize that fundamentally this is a message of hope. This is Jesus saying to us, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God is near to you. And this is good news for all of us. We need to receive it as such. I think I want to show you a little clip here at this point from uh, from The Chosen. 
And uh, I think this is the first time that anybody did this at North Langley. And honestly, ever since Janet and I started watching The Chosen, and we haven't been faithful, we watched little bits and pieces, but I, I just was watching and thinking, oh, fright, what does this all mean? Like for the church, because it's so captivating. And, uh, and I think, are we going to start, um, you know, watching the, the Chosen and thinking that everything that happened in The Chosen is like the Bible? And, and it isn't really. It's like there's a lot added to it. They tell a backstory and everything, but they do a really good job. It's kind of like watching visually a commentary. And how many of you watch this series of Chosen? Yeah, a good number of you. It's, it's, it's really amazing, and you can get it on you know, YouTube. But, it, but here I'm going to show you just a little clip of, of Jesus, uh, and he's got uh, his disciple with him, and his disciple is Matthew. So one of the things in The Chosen is they... Uh, they sort of surmise that because Matthew was a scribe and a, an accountant, a tax collector, that he was the guy, right? And because he wrote the gospel, that he was always recording things when Jesus uh, spoke. And, and they do a funny thing with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, kind of, they show Jesus practicing his Sermon on the Mount. Like he's, and he's running it off his disciples and say, saying, how does this sound, you know, kind of a thing. And I'm like, I'm not sure he did that, but in fact, uh, but... But just watch this clip, and then uh, and then let's let's think about it. Have I? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Yes. How is it the map? If someone wants to find me, those are the groups they should look for. <laughs> and then? You are the salt of the earth. I really like what they what they did with that description. See, Jesus had said to Matthew in the on the, in the video there that he said, "I'm going to give you a map," and that, that's a good way of thinking about the Beatitudes. They are a map. They are a description of the life where you will find Jesus, where Jesus is, where the kingdom of God is, and the kingdom of heaven is. And that is the kingdom of heaven is where Jesus is ruling. It's the place of the good life. It is the reality. The reality that we're looking for, the reality is with Jesus. So, and you see, and you heard that word of hope at the end, which is the section following the Beatitudes. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So, let's uh, in thinking about these Beatitudes and the way that we are in our con context thinking about what the good life is. Let me let me just. Uh, give you a couple of my own sort of secular beatitudes or modern day beatitudes. So this is how I think that 
we think about the good life. We might say this, happy is the person who achieves their dream in their life, for they can enjoy life without regrets. Happy is the person who has found love and romance, for there is nothing better than to be in love. Happy is the person who can experience the best in life. They didn't miss out. Happy is the person who is admired, adored, and followed. They will always feel special. Happy is the person who lives true to themselves. They found the only truth there is. And happy is the person who markets their own virtue. They will feel morally superior. So, I don't know, there's probably others that you could think of if you meditated on it for a little while, and I'm not encouraging you to do that. But these are the messages that are explicit in our music, they are in our movies, they are the messaging in our culture, and they are messages that are taught to our children in our school system right through university. They're normal in our society. And we see a lot of confusion. Last Saturday, I was out with family on Robson Street. We had uh, Omar and Wendy, the couple from Kalima, that were up here for our move camp. And uh, their kids, they were with us, and so they wanted to go to the city, so we were on Robson Street yesterday afternoon. Well, what a treat. Down the middle of the street came about 100 naked people on bicycles. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't see any of you there. Uh, but honestly, I didn't notice many faces. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, so while they were riding down the street, they were saying something, I guess, about the good life. Maybe they were saying, happy are those who could care less what anybody else thinks. Or maybe it was, happy are those who do something crazy so that others take notice. I don't know, and I'm not sure they were really thinking about it that much, but they had a message. I didn't quite get it. It was good that the police were escorting them, and the police were closed, or had clothes on, which was also a plus. Uh, and uh, guarding their rights, I suppose. But um, these are the beatitudes that are sort of accepted in our culture. Just, you know, do what pleases you. Uh, don't, be, don't judge anyone. Do whatever you want. And, uh, and then I think about personally, maybe we all have beatitudes that are playing, uh, the tapes that play in our mind. And whether we're intentional about it or not, just invite you to reflect, what, what are the Beatitudes that uh, are, you know, are unique to you, that go on in your mind, the things that you think about a lot, that shape your spending habits, that consume your time, that worry you most in your life? It, is, it, is it the Beatitudes that, that Jesus has outlined? I think a lot of the times my, my beatitudes, the things that I think about, are not the things that Jesus is talking about here. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So let's focus on this teaching then for just a few minutes here as we come towards the end. The life where God is near, the good life, the blessed life. The word blessed is a Greek, the Greek New, the New Testament's written in Greek, and it's the Greek word makarios. And it's, uh, we translate it blessed, which comes from the Latin word beatus. You know, we know the name Beatrice, bringer of joy and blessings. But the, the word blessed uh, that the, you know, is in the Greek uh, translates the Hebrew idea that Jesus would have been using the word asher. And Asher has to do with discovering what is right and meaningful in the midst of shallow and superficial options. That's how Earl Palmer, uh, a New Testament scholar, describes it. Discovering the right and meaningful in the midst of shallow, superficial options. Happy is the person who has found the right path, who has God's map. Daryl Johnson says it this way, Makarios, blessed, does not refer to how you or I assess ourselves, or our condition, Macarius refers to how God assesses us and our condition. God says, you are on the right path. You are in the right place. Happy are you. Jesus is near. And the word for poor here, literally, poor in spirit, is poor as a beggar. Not just broke, but poor as a beggar. 
And the realm of poverty is of spirit. It's not, this isn't saying, you know, happy are you if you've got no money in your account. That, that's not what it's saying. It's saying poverty of spirit. If you're in a place of brokenness, emptiness in your spirit. Why poor in spirit? Because when we are poor in spirit, we can receive from God. Because our self-assurance and pride is minimized. When we're poor in spirit, we're not feeling proud of ourselves. We're not self-assured. We're not full of our own plans. We're in a place of desperation. We're in a place that you might find commonly when you read through the Psalms. The Psalms are perpetually talking about the, the writers are in a place of poverty of spirit so that they can receive from God. When we're in poor in spirit, we have surrendered our need to control We've let go of the need to control everything because we realize that our control is it, it's ineffective. We never really had it anyway, but we've let go of that. When we're poor in spirit, we see the mess that we've made. When we're poor in spirit, we are near where Jesus can be found. In, the early, uh, in early 1930, Bill W., an alcoholic, came in contact with a spiritual renewal known as the Oxford Group. That's a fascinating story about uh, spiritual renewal that happened in Oxford. Uh, yeah, amazing story of how God worked in those days among students and all across Europe, actually, in America through the university movement. But Bill's life was changed by, by the encounter with Christ, and he became sober through a spiritual renewal. Later, he went on to write the 12 steps. The first is, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Second step, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, Third, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Fourth, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. And fifth, I'll, I'll read, admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Some of you who have taken Freedom Session will recognize the, the familiarity of these 12 steps. It's an articulation of being poor in spirit. My life became unmanageable. I realized I was powerless to control it. I was a person poor in spirit. So if this is a, a good place for us to be, and it doesn't mean that we're, we're broke, destitute, incompetent, useless, but it means we've come to a place of recognizing that we're, we're in need. We're in great need. How can I become that person? How can I be poor in spirit? You know, there's many places in Scripture where people, uh, we hear the stories of people poor in spirit. One of the most famous is the story of the prodigal son from Luke 15. Jesus told this story about a person, this uh, young boy who uh, took his inheritance, spent it all in wild living and found himself broke and feeding the pigs and thought he was at the end of, the, of his rope. He was poor in spirit. He said, I, could, I should go home. And, uh, and so, can I, how can I be poor in spirit? Do I have to, like, make a mess of my life to do that? And, uh, you know, all, many of you, if you grew up in church, sometimes you heard a testimony of somebody who was drug addicted, and you think, oh, wow, you know, that's amazing. What a testimony of a changed life. I never, that never happened to me. Uh, just, you don't have to mess up your life hugely or make some dramatic statement to become poor in spirit. If that's your story. Uh, praise God, God saved you beautifully. But you don't have to follow that path. But you have to come to the same awareness. And uh, another story of poor in spirit that came to my mind a few years ago, I read the biography of Francis of Assisi. He's famous for being poor in spirit. Francis was also a young man, had a, came from a wealthy family. But he didn't like his dad at all, nor did he like his dad's plan for his life. His dad wanted him to be a lawyer. So Francis was struggling to sort of, in his teenage rebellion, figure out what he wanted to do with himself. And one day he found himself in a church at the end of his ro rope, and he felt God speak to him, build my church. And so he thought this church looked really run down, and he thought the call was to give money to help rebuild the church, which he did. The thing is, his money that, that he had wasn't his own, it was his dad's money. So he took all his dad's money and gave it to the priest and, to rebuild the church. Dad was really mad, took his son to court, and uh, wanted his money back. So there they were, crowds were in attendance, and the, the, the son and the father were in front of the priest, and the priest said, look, you know, the, the dad has a case 
Francis, you need to make amends and restore everything that, uh, you know, to your father. And he said, well, I don't have anything and, uh, except these clothes. And Francis, by the way, had really dressed up to the nines for the occasion. He had all the best clothes that he had, which tells you this was a stunt. And, uh, but he said, but I'm happy to give it all back. And he stepped behind the curtain, took all his clothes off, stripped naked. And uh, maybe this is what the bicycle people were into. I don't know. He stripped naked and he came and just put the clothes in front of the priest and said, here's everything that my father has given me. You know, I give it all to the church. And uh, everybody was in shock. And Francis, he matured after that. Uh, and he did a lot of amazing things and became a real uh, spokesman. But that sort of was a defining picture of his life. He had chosen this pathway of poverty. How does a person become poor in spirit? Do you renounce everything? Do you do some you know, dramatic gestures? But poor in spirit is not incompetence. It's not victimhood. It's not a dramatic gesture. Poor in spirit, according to Jesus, is a place where we're at the center of God's kingdom and close to his presence. Jesus said it this way in John 15, where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are cut off from the vine, you will not bear fruit, you will not live. But if you are connected with me, you will bear much fruit. And then he said this, apart from me, you can do nothing. You depend upon me. I am here for you. You are poor in spirit when you depend upon him. So in my life, uh, here's some things as I thought, how do I, when, when do I know that I'm poor in spirit? And one way is when I am aware of how I have hurt others. And not just aware, but when I uh, am contrite about it, when I repent of it, when I really deal with it. You know, I could, you could be aware that you've hurt others and sometimes you, you know, you don't, it doesn't touch you, but when, when, I, when I know it, when I feel convicted about it and, I, and I'm contrite about this. So relationships are so important for us to know our own poverty, our poverty of spirit. I hurt people. Sometimes I say hurtful things. Sometimes I say impulsive things. Uh, marriage is a, a really important relationship where you learn that. You hurt someone close to you that you love and you realize, this is bad. Why did I do that? What is it about me that does that to people? And so uh, God really, uh, you know, I think it, marriage is a divinely orchestrated relationship where we're with a person of the opposite sex and we're, we're, we love them and we are in a relationship, but they're different than us and we misunderstand and feelings are hurt and we learn to be humble. Uh, another way that I learned this is... Uh, where I hurt others is just saying stuff, you know, maybe me trying to sound like I had the right thing or a smart thing to say. I remember one time in my role as conference minister, you know, I should be a respectable person. I was in a conversation. I just said something careless and uh, another person just got hugely offended by it. Yeah, whether it was that person's ego that was at issue, I don't know. But in the end, it took up so much time. Other people had to have meetings. Other people were involved. I had to apologize for everything. It was just like, what a horrible mess. And how did I get into that horrible mess? By saying something stupid that I shouldn't have said. And I was just like, I have a big mouth. <laughs> why, why did I do that? And I thought, Lord, I know why I did that. Because I didn't pay attention to you and to what you would want me to say in a situation. I didn't attend to you. And so I felt that poverty of spirit I think another way that I'm aware and we can cultivate poverty of spirit is just being acknowledging how self-centered we are. Our, our constant selfishness. We learn this in community too. We need other people to help reflect back into our lives, our own sort of skewed self-centeredness. Sometimes when I serve, I notice that nobody gives me the credit. And I stew about that. And I think, huh. What does that say about me and my poverty of spirit? So our attitudes are checked when we're in community. I think another way that we are reminded of poverty of spirit is when we encounter illness and the brevity of life. Someone that's close to us suffers, another dies. And it's like a message, you know, God saying, hey, 
Your life is short. What is, what is it like when you stand at the graveside and you see the body and you realize, oh, you know, all that person's plans, all that person's wealth, all their memories, it's over and gone. God, what is the meaning of my life? It makes us feel poverty of spirit, dependence on him. And then maybe the most important and gracious one that I want to just acknowledge is that poverty of spirit, being poor in spirit, comes also in the presence of God through worship. Acknowledgement of the glory of God and the gratitude for the mercy of the cross makes us poor in spirit in a beautiful way. I think, God, you're so great. And that's, I love the worship. I, I just love so much that coming together with all of you to worship the Lord and the worship that we're blessed to have. We come into the presence of God and see how good he is. And then we realize, God, I am humbled before you. And we, we can be worshiping God day in and day out through this wonderful season when we're out there in the beauty of nature. Don't just drink it in. Look around at the majesty of the mountains and the majesty of his creation and say, God, that you should attend to me, that you should love me, being poor in spirit. This spring, uh, a famous atheist author and speaker uh, who's kind of career I've tracked a little bit, not hugely, but I read her story years ago when it came out. She wrote a book called Infidel. Her name is Ian Hersey Ali. And this last year, she came out as a Christian. She was an outspoken atheist. She was a popular speaker on the atheist circuit with Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens when he was alive, and others. And so recently, and you should YouTube this conversation, she got together in a conversation with Dawkins, and he's irritated at her, obviously, because he's still carrying the, the atheist banner, and here Ian has come out as a Christian. And they have a really wonderful conversation. She's only been a Christian, I think, for about six or seven months at this time, so she's not the most, she's not really a great defender of Christianity, but, but she is. It's amazing. And uh, they ask her at the beginning, how did it come that you have had such a change in her life? She said, I, I, was, I, I lived with depression and debilitating depression for about a decade. She said, I despaired of life. I went to psychiatrists. I sought every kind of medical help, scientific evidence-based help that I could with no success. I went to one therapist and she suggested to me that my problem might be something else entirely. She said, I am. I believe you're living in complete spiritual bankruptcy. You're poor in spirit. So I am resonated with that. She, she'd been an atheist for these many years. So she began to pray. She said, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And her life changed dramatically. I won't tell you everything that she shared, but she said, my joy for life has returned, and I'm so deeply humbled. I don't have all the answers. And you can hear her struggle to answer questions that he gives, but she answers them well. She knows God, and she has the kingdom of heaven. When we are poor in spirit, we are, we are where God is with us. <laughs>